Paul Cézanne is a great admirer of Delacroix and early on allied himself with Impressionism, although he soon was convinced that Impressionism lacked form and structure. He wanted to make Impressionism solid and durable, like museum work. He sought to order the patterns and colors that make up nature, provide structure to the perceived chaos. And this is really something that we see a lot in the middle to end of the 19th century. After all, Victorian Europe is all about categorization. We're categorizing plants and animals and people and all sorts of things. So Cezanne is jumping on this bandwagon, but he wants to categorize, well, visual imagery. And he does so through Basket of Apples. Now, this piece is going to be painted in 1895. And what we see is the structure and controllability of still life, which allowed the artist to have a well-ordered point of departure for his experiment with line, plane, and color. Interestingly, he was so analytical that he couldn't use real fruit because it would rot. So what he does is, so what he is, is the opposite of impressionist. He takes a great deal of time studying a subject to get to its essence. Here, shapes become their components. Apples, for example, become spheres. And let's focus on that for a second. So what we're going to see is these various forms will be boiled down. This is really sort of early abstraction in a major way. What he does is he takes an apple, for example, and he goes, okay, what makes an apple an apple? Well, it's got that little hole in it, so we see that. Not too many stems, but we do see that flower end on many of them. It's more or less a spherical form, uh, a little bit irregular. It's generally red, yellow, or green, and usually mottled, so blended in uh, with some red and some yellow and some green, as we see here. Or the bottle, which has become a simple cylinder. Now, could he add a lot more detail? Sure, but he's trying to simplify it. He's trying to categorize it. What shape is an apple? Where does it fit? What basket does it fit in? Now, he also creates a certain visual disjunction in created... Sorry, there's a visual disjunction which is created by his zeal to understand visual space. This is a precursor to cubism. For example, these lines. Now, these lines should line up. After all, this is the tabletop here. This is the tabletop here. So you would expect the bottom edge of the tabletop to line up, but it doesn't. Same with the table at the back. Uh, and all of these different elements. Nothing lines up quite right. Why? Because he controls the picture plane. It's that simple. This is going to open the door to cubism and other movements in the future because he is taking one step further than Degas did with the tub. What he's going to do is basically sit there and say, I control the spatial arrangement. I control the space itself. And therefore, I can depict it any way I want. The idea is, hey, there's a table here that you read as a table. There's a table here that you read as a table. Does it really need to line up? Does it really need to match? Because it doesn't affect the still life itself. We still get the idea of apples and this uh, sort of jagged, disjointed napkin in very raw brush strokes. We get the idea of the wine bottle in the background. Everything seems to fit, even when I alter spatial reality itself. Now, how long can you look at the piece before you start to recognize all of the spatial issues? For example, with this, this is a plate of Twinkies. And you're saying, but Twinkies weren't invented until 1930 and we're in 1895. I know, but tell me that doesn't look like Twinkies. Moving on, you'll notice that they are levitating Twinkies. There should be one right here holding it up. After all, there's one here and there should be one right about here holding it up. This is impossible Jenga, which sounds like a great Doctor Who episode, but it reflects his focus. He's not worried about the visual reality of what this pile of lady fingers or Twinkies or whatever it is looks like. He's worried about the viewer. And as the viewer, we simply read it as a display of pastries. We aren't concerned about whether or not it's 100% accurate. It's 
the people in tweed coats and the students that are forced to listen to them that are concerned with whether or not that is reflecting a spatial reality. And also let me point out the table here does not match the table here, which of course would come across like that. So he's altering that spatial reality. It could be argued that this work is a substantial step out of natural art towards the abstract. After all, abstraction is trying to capture things that it camera cannot. And a camera cannot categorize in visual terms the world around it. Whereas Cezanne can look at an apple and say it's basically a sphere in this color scheme. He can look at a wine bottle and say it's a cylinder like this. He can look at a Twinkie and, you know, make it do impossible Jenga. This is a major step towards abstraction, removing the artist from the realm of visual reality. And of course, the artist needs to because a camera is far more effective at capturing honest visual data than an artist because the artist is always going to alter things. That's the nature of art. So Cezanne, if there's one thing that makes this a particularly substantial piece of art, it is that he is taking that major step towards abstraction, controlling spatial reality and moving away from or divorcing himself from the illustrative nature of art, moving towards art as abstraction, just like Van Gogh moved it towards expression.